A serious situation in the Florida Keys that continues to baffle scientists. Dozens of endangered sawfish swimming erratically and some ending up dead. And this just in brand new video of yet another sawfish this weekend flopping in the shallow waters of Isla Mirada. Our environmental advocate Louis Aguirre has been reporting on this for weeks. He's here this morning, but first we want to show you his most recent report. Our sawfish continue to die right before our eyes. There's nothing I could have done to, you know, help it or drag it in or you just kind of sat there and just kind of like watched it. Hard to see and it's definitely heartbreaking. Tim Friend and Ashley Fermanic were in Key West Tuesday visiting from Massachusetts when they came across what's now become a painfully prevalent sight. It was kind of very sad to see him, you know, struggling. just struggling and another critically endangered small tooth sawfish suffering in the shallows, this time at Fort Zachary Taylor Beach. It seemed like several people on the beach were trying to, they wanted to go and grab it and put it back in the ocean, but the conservation didn't allow them to. On Monday, NOAA launched an unprecedented emergency response, engaging partners like FWC to try and rescue sawfish found in distress. Officers could be seen in the water trying to help the massive animal. Sadly, it would not survive. FWC confirming it was a female, and now the 32nd small tooth sawfish reported dead since January, the fourth this week alone. I'm so sorry, buddy. With more than 100 witness accounts of others seen swimming erratically, beaching themselves. What the hell? Thrashing about in shallow waters from the Everglades to Key West and now all the way north to the Boynton Beach Inlet. Wow. Since October, researchers have been out sampling the waters of the Lower Keys, believed to be ground zero for the devastating event. Still, there's no smoking gun. We don't really know. Um, again, this is something we have not documented before, so we have not seen this. What scientists are seeing are elevated levels of gambiardiscus, a benthic microalgae linked to ciguatera that lives on seaweeds. They were anywhere from five times higher to about 30 times above averages that we've seen over the past 10 years or so. But are the levels of toxic gambiardiscus high enough to cause this? The experts still stumped. Louis, thank you so much for joining us. You know, Thanks I'm in the Keys. Me. You're the environmental guy. Mm -hmm. You've been talking to so many people. What have you learned? It's still such a mystery. It is a mystery, and so many people are disturbed by it, especially Keys residents, because the city, it impact their lifestyle, potentially their economy, and still, question marks when scientists have been out there on the water since October and we still don't know we, even though we think it might be a proliferation of gambier discus they're not able to say conclusively that that is the smoking gun that we're looking for the lead on this investigation is FWC, FWC. I'm so so glad that we have Gil McRae who's with us right now he is the director of FWC's research institute um, so Gil thank you so much for joining us can you just sort of give us the, the latest on what you're finding well it's good to be with you thank you for having me um, so as the report said, um, we began to receive reports of fish swimming erratically back in November of last year. And since then, those reports have expanded from the Lower Keys north, although they're still concentrated in the Lower Keys. And also during that time, we've had a number of small tooth sawfish mortalities, which is concerning because it is an endangered species. I will say that the, the erratically swimming fish other than the sawfish they have not experienced massive mortalities, and they do appear to recover if they're moved into cleaner water, which supports potential exposure to a low-level toxin. We're working with a team of state, nonprofit, and federal scientists to try to figure out why the sawfish are affected differently, but it certainly is a concern. And we saw FWC in the water with the sawfish on Tuesday back in Key West, uh, FWC reached back out and said that was not an official rescue attempt. So what were we, what, what were we witnessing then in that moment? And then there, there is new video of FWC in the water with Moat Marine Lab. Yesterday, they captured a live sawfish in one of the canals off the Keys. Can you give us some insight as to what's happening here? Yeah, we have put together a team to attempt to rescue and potentially rehab sawfish that are in distress. We're very interested in figuring out whether sawfish if moved to cleaner water can recover like some of the other fish have however keep in mind this has never been done before and some of the sawfish that have beached themselves are very large it's a very tricky thing to find a sawfish that is healthy enough given the distress we've seen them in to survive the transport to a facility for potential rehab 
So the one that was caught yesterday, is that the first one that you were able to catch? I believe it is, yes. You know, you guys have been sort of front and center on this, and, you know, it is a good thing because, you know, so many people have sort of in an information vacuum or what they perceive to be an information vacuum, they, they fill it with maybe misinformation or speculation. You know, I want to give a shout out to Captain Dave Dupre um, in the Florida Keys because he's gone on to some of these Facebook groups and have posted the public information that's available from FWC. Because Gil, you and I were talking about this, you know, at this point, um, you know, this is not considered a fish kill. At this point, you're not thinking that this is because of anything coming from Lake Okeechobee, a anything that you want to dispel. Yeah, that's correct. There's no connection to Lake Okeechobee releases, and we understand the concern. It, it certainly is disturbing to see fish swimming erratically, and these these large uh, sawfish beaching is is also not something we like to see. But as far as we can tell, there's no link to any uh, pollutant. Uh, we have ruled out uh, things like red tide. Um, if in fact it is tied to Gambier discus or some other microalgae producing toxin. These are microalgae that occur naturally in the Keys. The questions relative to are they more abundant now than they typically are and are they producing more toxins or different toxins than they have in the past, that's what, something we're working hard to figure out as we speak. And that, that's what's concerning because Gambier discus is, is in fact tied to ciguatera even though there have been no reports of anybody getting sick from either eating infected fish or from having any contact with water. But Dr. Michael Parsons, who's leading the, the, the research on this out of Florida Gold Coast University, did say in our report that there is three to 10 times the amount normally seen of Gambier discus in the water, yet they don't believe Gambier discus is a smoking gun quite yet. Can you help us understand why that is? If we're seeing more levels of Gambier discus, why are we not saying conclusively that's what's causing this? Well, you have to realize there are multiple algal species that produce toxins and multiple toxins. So we have this matrix of multiple species and multiple toxins. All of that has to work, be worked through both in the field and in the laboratory before we can make a connection. Do you think that there's any potential connection to the reporting that we've done from last summer and then usually high and prolonged uh, warm water event that we had in the Florida Keys and the corals dying? Could there be a connection there? There certainly could be. And whenever we have an event like this that's out of the ordinary, it makes sense for us to look at things that happened in the recent past that were also out of the ordinary. And certainly that very, very warm summer was out of the ordinary. One thing that I, I want you to address, too, for people who maybe don't understand what a sawfish is, because they're these unusually look, looking creatures, mm -hmm. these are endangered species. Yeah, that's correct. A small tooth sawfish are endangered, federally endangered. They're a member of the shark family. Uh, they are, uh, their distribution has been reduced to southwest Florida in the Keys, so we are a hot spot in Florida for recovery of these species. And we've been working on them for decades with FWC and our federal partners. So uh, when this event happened, we, we had a team of experienced sawfish biologists ready to respond and they are down in the Keys, again, attempting to uh, potentially rescue and rehab one of these fish so we can learn more about what might be causing these issues. I think what many of the conservationists are worried about is the loss of females. We, uh, we're seeing a, a ratio of one to one, if I'm not mistaken, of females to males that have been found dead in Florida waters. Uh, but let's bring back the uh, topic of Gambier discus because there's a hypothesis that was floated by not just Dr. Michael Parsons, but also uh, Dr. Allison uh, Robertson is working the toxicology part of this mystery from the University of South Alabama. They believe that it may have been, as you were saying, may have been sparked by warm waters, but Gambier discus does not thrive in warm ocean waters. If this is in fact fueled by Gambier discus, do you believe that the warmer waters can in fact cool this down? Because right now, people are worried about mitigation. Like, how do we put a stop to this? And right now, we're just watching this play out in real time. Yeah, those are good points. Typically, when the water warms, as we move into spring and summer, Gambier discus densities are reduced. And if, in fact, these issues are tied to Gambier discus and production of a toxin from that species, we would expect these issues to decline and ultimately resolve themselves as we move towards summer. 
So many questions. Gil, you know, thank you so much. I mean, I just think that there there have been so many questions and so many concerns, not just by scientists, but also people who live in the Keys, people mm -hmm. who make their livings off the Florida waters. I think it's also important that we underscore that no one has gotten sick. And, and I think that's the big concern. What is the impact to humans? What is the potential impact to humans right now? We haven't seen that quite yet. Is that correct, Gil? Yes, yes. The Department of Health monitors the potential exposure to ciguatera from consuming seafood, and they have uh, not documented any cases uh, in that part of the state in the recent uh, in the recent past. And Gil, where can people go every week? FWC updates your findings. Um, talk about where people can go to, to look at sort of the latest numbers. Yeah, you can visit our website at myfwc.com. You'll see links there to our weekly updates, as well as information on how to report a fish kill, fish swimming erratically, or specifically uh, issues with sawfish. And that's very important because it is because people are actually sharing these videos and sharing these images that we're able to respond in a very timely manner. I wanna stress that, that the public is definitely part of solving this mystery. Absolutely. Gil, let me ask you this, my final question, just in what you've seen over the last few weeks since some of these first um, er erratic fish behaviors started getting reported, are you seeing a, a decline? Is this still happening steadily? Um, talk about sort of sort of the, the arc of things right now. Well, it's tough to say for sure because we think as the word got out, people reported them more frequently. Uh, but it does seem that the level of calls we're getting to our fish kill hotline, other than the sawfish mortalities, which seems seem to still be an issue, uh, have either tapered off or plateaued a bit. But again, that could be an artifact of uh, uh, you know, people either experiencing some fatigue or uh, perhaps the uh, communication of how to get these reports to us. Gil McRae with FWC, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. It's an important issue, not just for the environment in the Keys, but all over Florida. So we do thank you for coming on. Thank you. And Louie, thank you so much for being here as well. I know you've been on the Thanks front lines of it. In. Yeah, <laughs> back in the field as soon as I'm out of here. That's right. <laughs> See you there, Louie. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Well,